got um, sorrel. I love to eat sorrel, and it's a great meal. Sorrel is a French green. There's a striped sorrel and a long leaf sorrel. And when this was in your nursery, I bought a couple of those little sorrel plants here from Grant and Danielle. And whoever came here with this little bird in your nursery, oh, it was such a treasure. Grant just, we just lost Grant last year. And he was my best friend. And believe it or not, Grant was in this thing the last six years. And I was here across the street farming regenerative agriculture, doing a test project to turn a sandy soil that he did tilling and tilling. I said, Grant, can I have three rows of junk till? And we put cover crops, building all shit like crazy. He and came back. Little crickets were in there. It was beautiful. And I watered once every week for over two weeks while Grant watered three times a week. Grant spent a fortune on chemical fertilizer. I planted cover crops. Little beans, little peas, barley, and that fed the microbes in the soil that we didn't till and kill. Tilling basically kills. It's really sad. When you tell farmers that they're like, what if you won't let me till? No. In fact, get rid of your machinery. You don't need it. And we teach them how commercial farmers are doing regenerative agriculture. And they're making more money instead of getting in debt. So it's really amazing. But what do you think? There's my beautiful white willow. It creates the most perfect filter light. The plants underneath just absolutely love it. And I hope all of you will come on to our list in the spring. Okay? Come about May, we might have, we'll have pea shrub flowers to eat. They taste like peas, but you're picking the flowers and eating them. Yeah, already. All everybody else is just buying their little seedlings, right? To plant and burn. We're eating. We eat most of the months out of the year out of this. There's something to eat in the food forest. Did you see the carpet on the ground, how beautiful that is? Don't you just want that? I cut some of the sun shows back because I wanted my other little plants to start growing. I've got some blue flax right there that you can see little carpet of blue flax. We call that the living mulch. And in here, it's 20 degrees cooler than it is out on the street or my neighbors. And it's moist. So I don't need this in the summertime. That's where I live. You can't get me out of there. I really don't want to leave because I love this and that. It's like a little garden of Eden, you know? It's amazing what you can do with plants when you learn how to design it. I'm going to take you a little further into it. This is what we call Zone 1, Kitchen Garden. That's because what I plant in here is going to be something I need to go out every day. And so I don't want it really far away. I want it right next to my kitchen door so I can go out and pick it fresh. My little herbs, my little vegetables, and I have some in there. Or my berries. I have some that are in here that will produce early in June, like my nankin cherries. I love to be able to just go out there and pick them. Yeah. Usually they don't make it to the kitchen, though. I eat them all. I'm literally foraging like an animal. I am. It's beautiful. And it's so nutrient dense. We do what's called a spectrometer test, the Briggs test. I had Lynn Beacon who did all the sprinkler systems for all the greenhouses and all these places and stuff. And he came to my food forest and he brought this little Briggs test. And I said, so what's the highest that a plant can go? He said, well, I've got some organic cherry tomatoes tested at a nine. I was like, oh, okay, go ahead and test my little um, yellow sun sugars. So we tested my little tomatoes. They tested at a 14 in the second year. I said, let's go test my peaches. Let's see what the juice of my peaches. How much nutrient density do they have? I know by the flavor and the juiciness. They also tested at about a 14, okay? So he's like, well, I've never seen that before. And I said, that's because nobody's growing like this. When you put all this together, living soil, look at that beautiful nurstation under there. It's just so amazing what can happen. This is what happens in rainforests. Nature doesn't like to grow all by itself. It grows together with others. It's all about the relationships between each other. This is what's called a little teeny hoople bed. And you've got some buckwheat as cover crop in there. It's under my beautiful Hall's Harding almond. 
right there that's just so loaded with elements all the way up to the top that I have to shake it. And then I'm open up on their own. And they'll drop. But if I can get more, I'll just shake it and they fall down. In fact, I don't even pick my apricots or my peaches or my plums. I go out three times a day with a basket because I know when they're right, they drop it. Before all the guys can get them, I go out there and I pick them. <laughs> and then I put them on all trays till I can make something with them. It's so fun to freeze dry, to can, to make juice, to freeze your berries, to dry them in leather. It's, and you know that the berries are the most high in vitamin C, antioxidant, antiviral, immune boosting. We have 36 kinds from sea buckthorn berries to gooseberries to jostle berries to blueberries to honeyberries to cordelia cherries. We have 11 kinds of cherries in this forest. So fun. I'm still looking all the time for more. And tonight, you guys can get these wonderful berries. She's got some poison berries and gooseberries over there that are really hard to find that you can get for 10% off. But you see the effect in here? That's my elderberries. They haven't ripened yet. My birds like to eat those beautiful sweet flowers. So I did cover them with some netting so that they didn't get them all. But I don't have a problem because everything balances out in nature. So people think, oh, you've got wasps, oh, you've got grasshoppers, oh, you've got snails and slugs. How do you kill them? It's like, no, take that word out of your vocabulary. There's no killing in nature. Why would God create something that you need to kill? He didn't. They take care of each other. They balance out. So the grasshoppers are eaten by the wasps. The worms don't need to be killed. And if you don't water at night, and if you give them a lot of comfrey and curly dock, which is high in minerals, which is good for your garden as well, they'll eat that. And I've got millions of that. Help yourself. See these little holes all over that? They don't want my stupid vegetables or my other plants because they're not so mineral dense. So they go eat that. So I enjoy it. And we live in harmony. Everything balances out in nature. You don't kill it. Uh, you learn to live with it all. Even the mice, because my garter snakes and my hawks and my neighbor's cats take care of those. I haven't had any in my garden, but we had a wingspan that looked like it was 12 feet wide. Beautiful owl flying through our neighborhood last summer. It was amazing. But what this attracts, 19 species of birds so far I've counted. I've had birds that don't belong up there, they belong down here, they're called Virginia rails. They live in marshes, and I'm like, how'd you get here? I don't have a marsh anywhere. And, you know, this is all sand up here. But a, a marsh bird showed up. I had this beautiful black bird with this orange on its wings show up one time. I couldn't figure out what it was. So I'll go to the plant identification, the insect identification, the bird identification, people on Facebook go, what's this? <laughs> oh, what's this huge wasp that was black? Right, orange wings that color right there. It's called a tarantula hawk. And they're like, did you get very close? I said, oh yeah, I was taking pictures. And it was looking right at me. And they're like, well, it's a good thing you didn't get too close because it can paralyze the tarantula. That's why it's called a tarantula hawk. And we never see them up here. We see them in the desert down south. So it's amazing the things that this amazing place. Currants normally, little black currants, we have white, red, golden, and black. They only grow about this big, those smaller ones. Mine, for some reason, grow this big every year. And I don't understand why. I'm like, okay, everything grows really big in here for some reason. It's just the atmosphere. You see the beautiful comfy leaves right down below? It's okay. The snails want to eat a little bit of it, or the grasshoppers. Because that's what it's there for. It eats minerals. But they don't eat my currants. In fact, my birds don't even eat my fruit half the time. I don't know why. I guess they're finding other things in there. You see? That's the comfrey right there. And herbalists will come over and go, how did you get that comfrey so big? I'm like, I didn't. It did it. They must like it here. So when you create this effect, of all these layers. There's my almond and sweet almonds right there. Really huge. It's so amazing. I can make my own almond milk. I'm so excited. 
as you can see, this is different than a manicured garden. They actually have some of my comfort, some of my nymphs. They come over. We had a second round meeting all summer long in 2020 in here. Yeah, it was really fun. It was really, really fun. So yeah, they're growing. It's growing on there. Literally. Literally. It's coming out of its seams onto the sidewalk. It's pretty amazing. When nature's happy, it just grows. It just thrives. It's so beautiful. That was the buffalo berry. They are native drought resistant. Those little orange berries right there. Very delicious. But the best, most nutritious one has 190 components. Omega-7. You can't get it anywhere else on the planet. It's good for your eyes and your skin. It's called the sea bug water. So we at Prince Salt Lake and a couple other companies, DMAE, you can buy these great skincare products that have sea bug and berry in it. They're very citrusy. And I tried to make a juice out of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was just really bitter. But I can eat the berries because it's citrusy. I really liked it. You can see the kind of mints that are flowering later in the summer and the bees. We have at least 50 different sizes, shapes, colors of bumblebees and native bees along with our own hive now. Isn't it beautiful? That's in the curly up right there. That's also the curly thing. But it's, it's just so beautiful to be in it all summer long. There's, this is a permaculture guy right here. So my buddy Moshe, he went down a couple years ago to Australia. This is where permaculture was first, a concept started in the 70s by Bill Wilson. He was the father of permaculture. And he literally said, we're going to have a problem in the future. He called it climate change. And I was like, he said that in the 1970s? He was a biologist with wildlife and everything. And they came to him and they said, we're having a problem because of deforestation. We've cut down so many forests already in the 70s. And we're starting to see some problems because of that. Well, that's because you just cut down your life support system of the planet. It's like NASA, we have a problem. We can't breathe. It's getting too hot. The water's disappearing, or we're getting too much of it. It wasn't balanced anymore. And so he said, well, I can't come up with anything better than nature. Put it back. Just put it back. Find out what the native plants are in that region. Go talk to the old people. Go get the seeds. Start planting. And that's what they've done all over the world. That's what I want to show you next, you guys. Okay? But Moshe here comes and visits me every once in a while. He's down at Mount Pleasant. We spent two months with the best teacher after Bill Wilson, Jeff Bob. He's probably done permaculture in a hundred countries. He's the course I took first eight years ago online. But I was like, Jeff Lawton, Utah is different than Australia. It's different than Burning the Desert in the Dead Sea Valley of Jordan. I need you to come to Utah. What am I supposed to do? I have cold tempered climate with snow, and then I get this hot desert arid sun. I'm like, help! How does this work? And I can't do swirls because I don't get enough water to run water down your swirls like you showed in Australia. So you, you've got to tell me what to do. So I had to start researching my own stuff. I researched with the native plant people. USU has great native plant research. Everything I could find, the reclamation restoration industry, the forestry people, and I made friends with everybody. And the best landscaping company in Utah, high end, they put in the city creek creek with all the native plants and stuff. That Steve Pendleton has done it 45 years, and his two sons and Joshua took the same permaculture course I took eight years ago too. And he found me on Facebook and he said, "You have a food forest because he lives in a condo, and he gets to these high end Deer Valley, Olympus Heights, and Park City places, but they won't let him do permaculture." They'll let him do a bunch of palms and all that, but they don't know permaculture. So he's like, can I come? I'm like, yes, sir, come on. And every year that we pick one of the students' designs to put in, you guys can walk around and see some of them around here. He comes and drives the excavator. He puts in the water system. So that's what I want to go to next.
can do. I'm going to skip through some of this, but I just want to share with you. This is what's going on. Not the CO2 that we all have to get in electric cars and stop driving gas cars. That's only 4% of the problem. 40% of the problem that we have all this going on, flood, drought, fires, everything, okay, is because we destroy the ecosystems that work, the life support system. They regulate the temperature, they regulate the hydrology cycle. They, you know, do everything. And that's what we've done. I was invited to the United Nations Summit to speak about permaculture, and I had a booth there. That was my poster, poster at my booth. Deforestation kills, just like cigarettes. Okay, <laughs> so that was, I thought that was catchy. Because people don't understand the value of these plants and this vegetation all over the planet. So this man here, one of my mentors, John D. Liu, he filmed the biggest project, 35,000 square kilometers. What these little Chinese people did on all these terraces, they built by hand. Okay? They literally did all those terraces by hand on 35,000 kilometers because they wanted to get out of poverty. And they were in this dry, desolate place, so he made friends. And here they are. Check this out. These little Chinese people went up there every day when they were busy farming. And they just pulled their shovels up there and started terracing and started planting trees. It's a very large region of China. This is what the rest of China looked like. And before they over-farmed and over-grazed and turned it into the desert, they used to look like this. They destroyed it. And we've done this all over the planet. But after this desolation, the engineers came. They said, let's do terraces. You won't be able to farm them on top. You're going to leave the forest. You're going to plant it. You're going to leave it there. And they started rebreeding. So they pinned up the goats. And they did this. You see? It's so cool. But they worked very hard to look at how these little people work. And then they created this. It's absolutely beautiful what's possible from this to that. <laughs> and all the species come back. Everything just comes back. You build it, they will come. I'm not kidding. Because I've done it. And it brought back the water because the water is held by the vegetation on the hillside. You look at our hillsides and I just want to tree them. I just want to go, but trees of native need no water. Just cover them. Okay? Hold the water in the ground. Put it into the aquifer. Not roll down the hill and disappear. You know? We need to do this. This is such, this is the biggest example of permaculture right here in the world. And this was over 25 years. The river used to be called the Yellow uh, River of Sorrow. They made it pristine clean. But then you go to other places that we know are really dry. People are living in famine. Ethiopia, that's the definition of famine. That poor country. I mean, it just <laughs> suffered. But guess what? They took this and these gullies that were just the flash floods and wash we see it in southern Utah. That's what it does. It creates this effect. But they did. This is Uganda. In six years, they took that kind of desert, and there were no streams, there were no rivers. The river came back. He tells him, we planted it, and suddenly the water came back. One of my newest best friends, right here, she was up in Park City three years ago at the summit, and I got invited. It was a 2030 net zero list, you know, go 100% green. The young people start planting trees because what she says is our only source of water in Tanzania. Everybody knows who Dr. Goodall is, right? That was one of the chimpanzee research centers that she was all her life working to save the chimpanzees. And their only source of water dried up. So they started with her roots and shoots program. She goes around the world. She was even on Jimmy Fallon recently talking about plant, plant, plant. <laughs> okay, that's what we need to do to save the planet. Plant everything back the way it was. Trees were planted and the water's come back. And I told her, I said, I'm going to share that with everybody. Thank you. I wasn't even a reporter. I just walked up with my phone. <laughs> I'm like, I'm taking advantage of this. <laughs> I'll never get to see that woman again. But they've 
done this. Ecosia is a search engine instead of Google. If you go use Ecosia, for every time you search, they plant a tree. They planted 147 million trees so far. So go support them because they're doing projects like this. They're recreating habitats where they log and they separate the habitats with roads and logging and everything else. The animals don't have a way to cross, so they put little green crossing areas for them. It's really beautiful. They've done all the world, South America. Now, my teacher, my first teacher, Jeff Lawton, out of Australia, that I took an online course with Joshua, he takes us to places like this. I don't know if you remember in 2018, California was all red, the worst drought in history. They were drilling in the water. San Joaquin Valley had 1,500 wells go dry, and they had to move those households somewhere else, but they still had to pay the mortgage, but the state had to subsidize to move them because they had no water. Right next door, ironically, in the 70s, an architect put permaculture design over 60 acres and 273 homes, passive solar homes, they don't have any irrigation. It is now over 40 years old. Fruit trees, there's food on the ground all the time. It didn't even phase them because of the design. I mean, the water comes in off the street, and there it is. You can find it in the middle of summer. And remember, I told you 60% of our drinking water. <laughs> and we're hurt, told us we're wasting. Hello, we don't need to. And then we cut off the water on the farmers that are growing food. I mean, they even asked on KSL. Oh, we're going to do a survey. What is more important, that you water your lawns or the farmers grow food? Do you really have to ask such a stupid question? You do. Yeah. I'm serious. I work in water conservation. Well, why? We're based in Water Conservancy District up north, Lake Ogden, that whole area. 60% reduction in water available to irrigation for landscapes this year. They're even asking for 10% less indoor. Never has happened. No. And still people are like, I'm going to use whatever I want. So go but why? And even Governor Cox said, pull out your turfs. And he created that H2O.com site, you know? They're like, why do you get people to do this? But we even have a tier system. Well, you can still have some more. We're just asking people not have so much of it. And you can get rebates. Everyone here can qualify for rebates. If you do low water, they do it in St. George as well. And do you know it's legal in Salt Lake City? The sustainability director told me up there. It's legal to take water off the street. And Dr. McCann, associate professor for USU at the Moab Permaculture, that I'm going to be speaking with all of them in uh, May. We're doing a huge summit for all the Western states. She actually is working with the health department to legalize gray water. So I'm going to show you a place. This was Bill Mollison, the father of permaculture. He said we would have problems because of deforestation. This here is an amazing example. Can you hold the questions till I finish? And I'm going to answer all kinds of questions. That's what Arizona looks like, right? The Sonoma Desert? That's what most guys look like. What they did, I'm going to stop until you start seeing what happens. What they did, this is during the Depression, and what was called the Dust Bowl. They over agricultured everything, they dried up everything, and it was just sand, blowing sand all over this country. So, FDR got everybody out there, they didn't have backhoes, they used oxen and their shovels. And they built these dams right on contour, because water always hits 90 degrees to contour. Stop the water, because it was just washing away, and we're like, we gotta catch and save all the water we can, because we're in a dust bowl. So they stopped that water, but then they abandoned these, we call them spells, they call them dams. They abandoned it. What happens when water stopped? It soaks into the ground. On every foot, square foot of earth on this planet, there's a thousand different seeds. Why do they not all come up at the same time? Go watch the God of Wonders. These amazing Christian scientists explain. Seeds germinate under certain conditions, and every seed on this earth came with its own little blueprints to tell it when to germinate. So, they built this, the water started soaking in. What did nature do? Because man abandoned this for 80 years, nobody goes out to see this. Very few people know this exists. I want you to just, I'm going to look at your expressions and you see this. <laughs> Do you just see what's possible when you catch water and let it soak in the ground in the sky? Sorry. 
sidewalk because I can't tap on the sidewalk yet. There's a pipe right there that's covered beautifully with plants and flowers all year, but it takes the street water, and then I have infiltration basins that it takes it from one to the other. And when I'm done, there's extra water to go to my neighbors. And so on and so on, just like two some layers in. This is what Thomas West Moral and Eagle Mountain wants to do. We need to do these things. This is another water system, okay? On YouTube, they put them in the containers. I'm just going to take it and water the garden. So I cashed off my roof into a sealed pre inch PVC pipe system that Joshua designed. I'm going to take it all the way up. This is before I covered it, and it looks pretty, and I can't even see it's there. And it goes up 500 feet uphill to the top of my garden. Just pressure and gravity, no power. Look how much water I get off one surface of my roof. Look at that. Into those basins right there that are mulched so it doesn't evaporate. Last summer, including my house water, I got my first $64 water bill. I think I watered this area once all summer. Eventually, I will not water. This food forest, I'll be able to go on a trip like Jeff Lawton did after he put it in the Jordan Desert, his green in the desert. He went away for six years. He came back, it was still alive. This is one of my students in Linden, an acre. We help, it's our privilege. We get all our students together, we put a garden in a day. So we put this in with Joshua. So that's her water system catching off her new house off the roof and goes out to a pond and her pool beds that grow so tall and green and beautiful. This is one of my students right now. This is his hundred acres. What's cool is he got really lucky. He bought property that the guy knew permaculture and already started taking water off the top of it into ponds. And you can get on contour all the way through the property. So we're designing more of it. And so that's one of my students right now. They learn also from the horticulture class of Jeff Lawton. This is explaining the water hydrology cycle. How from the seas and the other water services it goes up into the sky. It's transportation. And then it comes back down as precipitation. And then it not only waters the surfaces, but goes back and around and feeds the aquifer across the street right there. I know that Cynthia will know about this one. They had a bunch of wells, and they're pumping up to 47 million gallons of water, 1,500 feet down. And I saw the commercial, I was like, So just imagine if we had designed, it's all stuck together, they don't have very big yards. Just think if we designed all together, catching the water and drought resistant native plants. I talked to a UV professor that was working with some of the students to work on some landscaping. He knew about permaculture and said, oh, it's too late. They're not going to go for that. And while they're still across the lake here in Saratoga Springs, I met with the water company that was building that. Oh, we're not putting batteries on that school. So that whole roof, water, is just disappearing, not being used. So we're going to pay $200,000, they told the school, to bring in piping, to bring in columnary water to water the lawn. But you can have this little 9,000 square feet and put a little food forest in there. So then like Babcock, the biggest architect in Salt Lake, the work on it, so like, Will you come and teach our architects so we can design it differently? We do a lunch and learn, come and teach us. People are starting to wake up. We've been doing things so backwards, you know? This man is a famous scientist that knows water systems in the world better than anyone else. And he's talking about how they took this desolate place in Australia and turned it into that beautiful place there. And so his little trailer here is about a movie that's coming out that if you do this, you will fix the planet, okay? A lot of people don't know. There's bacteria on the leaves of trees. Governor Cox's website says we do have weather modification. It's called cloud seeding. It's chemical ice nucleation to seed the clouds. Why? 
you know, touching, and I grow my sunflowers, and I grow my alfalfa, and I grow my milkweed. They don't want water. Leave them alone. That's where I can grow a weed. Because some of them are not weeds, they're herbs. So I had to take them out of here because they wouldn't grow in here. <laughs> I had to try to put them in the hot sun. <laughs> Ugly, sandy soil, you know? But that's my cute little hairy mesh, which is a pea family as well. And my little, um, I like to do blue flax in the summer and the buckwheat because they're lower to the ground. But in the winter, the deer come and raise my barley, my winter rye, my wheat, and they eat it so it doesn't go all the way to the ground. And they come back later and raise it again. It helps it grow faster. So I invite deer into my garden. I invite birds. I invite snakes. I live in harmony with them all. And healers tell me that the energy in this is through the roof. There's so much healing energy in nature, and it feeds off of your energy, and you feed off of it, and you walk barefoot in there because you're grounding yourself. They love coming here, the energy healers. Because it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And even the vegetables, we love root crops, so we plant a lot of root crops in here. But this is what's amazing. It's 20 degrees now. In this winter, as it starts to frost, when you're surrounding plants that have been there with all the other vegetation, is what happens. They don't freeze. So I can extend this even longer. It's actually amazing what you can do. How are we doing on time? Yeah. Okay. So I want to leave the rest up to some questions. You can see we do tours. Yeah. 
And that will start building in the soil. It's called the Back to Eden Method. Everybody knows Paul Koch in Washington. Other questions? Chip Drop is how you do that to create a wall. But yes, I've got, I've got a secret. Utah Tree Works, Peter, is Chip Drop for our area. I call him directly. So I give all my students his number. <laughs> Utah Tree Works, there you go. Don't tell. You can tell them I sent you. Because they love getting business and stuff. But that's what we go through. And it's a fun journey. You can see, you can sign up over there if you want to come and learn, you know, and take a tour and see it in the spring. Um, I also have cards over there. So, any other questions? Valerie brought out that they have these great berry bushes. Like I told you over here, these are almost impossible to find. Gooseberry, boysenberry, okay? I would snatch these up. It was so hard to find some of these plants last year. I don't know where you got them. I didn't buy them, but I am very excited to get them. I bet they were very excited. Trees, berry bushes are getting harder and harder to find, so I'm excited. And we're going to work together to bring some other food forest plants to shape, okay? Because I think that would be a wonderful thing for all of you guys as you learn what's possible, okay? So come and check these out. There's, there's goji berries that have protein in them. They're so delicious when they start to shrivel and dry on the vine. That's when all the sugar comes in there. They're so sweet. That's wonderful. These little hops plants, put them where they can grow like crazy over fences and trellises and stuff, but that's your calming tea. Dry the flowers at the end of the year and make tea and it calms you down, kind of like lemon balm. So that's a great one to have hops. And they've got all kinds of blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. It's really amazing that they have this right now. I was like, wow. Oh, so, probably you know, my students always ask this question, but if I have plants right now like this in a pot, what do I do? I can't put them in the ground, it's frozen, right? So you take them and you put some mulch, put them against the house somewhere so they can start to acclimate. They don't need any water, but mulch them so the roots stay warm. You can use straw, you have some leftover leaves, or you can actually put the pot into the ground so it, you know, this thermal and keeps it warm. And then when spring comes, you can go ahead and designate where you want to plant this, okay? But you can, you can keep them alive. These are very hardy plants. They're woody and they really thrive in this weather. So every one of these berries that she brought out in the grapes are really good. The hops, I would bring in the house. That's the only one, but I might bring in the house and wait till summer, okay? It doesn't like full hot sun. It wants They're not leaving yet, so I think you're going to be fine because they're just focusing on the roots right now. So I think they'll be fine. That's what we do with cuttings. We put them in the dark in that garage. And we break off all their leaves because we want them to root. And then in May, we bring them out into shade. And we let them grow. Then we plant those cuttings that we do in March and in the fall.
going live the whole time, you guys. <laughs> We've had a bunch of people watching us. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Dennis. Oh, this is um, Arelli in Orem. How are you guys? I'm going to shut this off now. Thanks for joining us.